Hello and welcome to another Lived Quality Conversation on the Lived Quality Podcast. And once again, I'm with my friend Wana, and uh, we've had so many conversations in the past, and here's another great one that we're going to dive in. Uh, we usually do not <laughs> script this. We, we roll with them, and retrospectively, we, we analyze and find out what it was about. <laughs> and, and I've been doing a lot of uh, writing as I try to decode what the conversations were about, and that has been amazing and wonderful, the things that I've been imagining. And so this is really good. Uh, so welcome, Wana. Always a pleasure to see you. And how are you? How have you been? And what's on your mind? Hey, Clayton. Thank you so much for having me again. We always have great conversations. Um, and I think those, we, though we do not script them, I think there's just something about the way they flow that really focuses in on one thing and it seems to just evolve and we get really deep into it, which I really appreciate. So they're always really good quality conversations and I look forward to each one. Um, it's great to be with you. And I think for myself, I'm currently sort of, I don't know, I'm in a healing state. I had um, an incident last week where I actually interviewed for a higher position and I found it really difficult to get over the things that I knew in retrospect I had not maybe said well or communicated well during the, the interview and I walked away kind of feeling like, I don't know if I let myself down, but kind of feeling like, oh, there was just something missing or I want to understand this part of me that's showing up and holding on to um, this sensational feeling of something's wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted to to look into that and understand where this was coming from and why. Um, and so I explored it in a um, coaching session last night and it was so powerful to dive in and to see how far back in my childhood this started and that mm -hmm. sensation that I knew so well and was familiar to me was part of a experience that I had um, as a child. And that experience has had held me there. And so every time I would do anything that perhaps to my standards wasn't good enough or maybe wasn't um, perfection, then I would go back to that sensation and I'd be like, oh, there's just something wrong, something wrong with me or, yeah. you know, why can't I get it right? And there was a lot of self-blame. And the other powerful thing I found was there was a lot of um, pride in amongst, you know, the humbleness of it because yeah. initially I'd be like, well, you know, I don't really mind if I um, don't get the job. It's all good. Um, but what arose for me was that the pride showed up as humbleness in me saying like, uh, for example, in the interview, I shared a story about an innovative approach that I brought to a project that I was undertaking. And while I'm talking about that experience and I'm trying to lay out the details, I didn't do a very good job of describing what the process um, of that innovation involved. And then I found myself after the interview going through the details in my mind and thinking, oh, they need to understand because it was so good and it was innovative. Maybe it wasn't, you know, groundbreaking or earth shattering, but never, nevertheless, it was innovative at the time that it happened. Um, and I also then created this story around like, oh, maybe they could contact this person because she was there and she can, you know, um, maybe back up some of the things that I shared in regards to that experience. And as I sat with it, and I was just like talking to God about it, and I was like, why is this happening? This is torture. And he just showed me that there were parts of me that were hiding um, which actually revealed itself to be pride because I had the need to justify my story or I felt the need to to create a story in my mind and be like yeah if only they confirm the details with the with this person then they're going to see that it's true and oh they must think that I have no integrity and you know and I value my integrity so much yeah. um, but in that moment I didn't need to do that and so I just began to see these aspects of myself within that experience of feeling like okay I failed that interview terribly but then seeing the aspects of myself that showed up that I didn't like mm. was really powerful in then bringing healing and bringing empowerment and confidence um, to who I really am. And, and 
you know, it's in these circumstances of stress or circumstances of um, tension that we find ourselves, um, these parts of ourselves showing up that we would otherwise not see, right? Mm -hmm. It's in these extreme circumstances, maybe something's happened, maybe there's some disappointment, but we find ourselves um, with these parts and we're like, I don't know what to do with this part, you know, and in the parts that feel uncomfortable and are not pleasant and the parts that we don't want people to see. And um, yeah, so I've just been th through that and, and just finding healing and acceptance and forgiving myself. Mm. Wow. Uh, so forgiveness is uh, a virtue in, in my, in my book. And, and I think that there's a whole need to, to do a, a, to hold that space for ourselves and and uh, be empathetic and kind to ourselves. Uh, when I started to do this, I started to notice how much uh, you know I was not being kind to myself and how I was not acknowledging uh, some of those things that you know you have to learn to work with. Uh, because, you know, we get, when we're growing up, it's sort of like we're being taught all these virtues and these values and they're being passed on as though they are absolute. And so you believe that it's fixed. It's only in the form that it's been presented to you and you have to learn it that way and try and uh, perfect that form. Uh However, you know, like we've, we've spoken before about this, like we all have our limits and we all have our, uh, our own nature and that nature sort of like influences our capabilities. And so, you know, when, you, when you're not looking inward to observe how you're responding and um, how you're managing right, the, the situation and, and how you're fitting in it, then it's very easy to sort of like get uh, sucked into the ideal, the idealism uh, uh, aspect, you know, where you, you sort of try to become absolute in a way because that's, that's the example that you have. Uh, but I, I feel like, you, you know, that self-awareness in sort of... Uh, resonating with with who you are because without you there can't be that experience right and so it's it's not being because we easily conflate it right like you know we we think in moral terms so there's this thing called being selfish that is taught in many cultures as not being a good thing because you have to be communal you have to be giving you have to be going outward um but I like to put a hyphen between it sometimes, like because sometimes you have to take care of the self. You have to mm -hmm. give yourself self care, because you know if you don't have that, if you if you don't maintain who you are and uh, how you're showing up, then you really can't be in a situation where you can give, where you can, where you can you know, rise up to whatever it needs to be risen up to. It's like these these are your own needs, your own personal mm. needs that have to be satiated, that have to be met. And those needs speak in all these ways that sort of like um, hold us back because we're sort of jumping the gun. Uh, and as example I like to use is, uh, let's say the hunger one. <laughs> and it, it's like, if you if your your body needs the food, uh, it will it will make this very clear to you in all the ways possible. Like you could be very resilient, right? Like because I've experienced this because I was doing a bit of fasting, and um, when you start off to learn how to fast, it's like the first maybe twelve hours it could be a breeze, and then after that it starts to be a challenge because um, your body is sending you the signals like, hey, more resources. And you're staving it off saying no. 
but it can amplify itself. So it, it finds ways, it knows you, like it's your body. <laughs> so it, it knows how to get through to you and will keep intensifying and you have to be, you know, really strong and, and, and find techniques to help you manage to cope. Otherwise you will, you will buckle, right? And so it keeps intensifying until to the point that even if you did not respond to your hunger pangs and all that, and if you're not, let's say, hydrating or taking in something to address the problem that the body is raising, like slowly it's, you start to lose the energy. It's like it, it now intensifies this, goes to physical strength. And if you if you walk through that level, then it's going to maybe start dealing with the emotional side of things. All of a sudden your mood starts to get <laughs> impacted and how you feel is starting to become a challenge. But it, our, our bodies are really wise and they're really strong and they know how to send information through. And I think paying attention to them, like paying attention to what's arising and what's going on is very, very fundamental uh, for us to sort of like understand who we are and who we are being in the situation uh, so that we can know how to respond to the situation and, or how to engage with the situation. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that was, that really stood out for me. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I really appreciate how you described it because, um, I mentioned also that, you know, and it resonates with what you've just finished off with, but that idea that there are circumstances in which the parts of us show up and perhaps mm -hmm. they are parts that we are not as familiar with or parts that we are very proud of, but that's still a part of us. And so cultivating a presence around those parts and understanding where they're coming from is really essential to us then transcending into the person that we want to be in each circumstance. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was thinking about this a lot too, because when I'm in an interview, for whatever reason, this one, I was so nervous and I couldn't explain. I just, I was so nervous. I wasn't sweating. My heart wasn't racing, but I just remember not feeling stuck, but just feeling nervous mm. um, with different signs and symptoms that I had not experienced in a normal nervousness before. And I was analyzing like, oh, maybe it's the nerves or whatever. And thinking about the circumstances of the interview and who was there. And then I was also thinking like, oh, there's a lot of positions I've held where I haven't been interviewed and I excelled. Yeah. I did extremely well. They just looked at, you know, what I did and my, my work and they just put me in those positions. They asked me to go for those positions. And I remember when I walked into this interview last week, one of the directors, one of the leaders actually said, I was so pleased when you put your application in. And so I feel really honored, like, oh, they see something in me and they were really happy that I had applied for the job and felt like maybe I had let myself down in that I didn't perform so well. But it's easy to get caught up in the details or, you know, again, back to that justifying of, you know, I'm, I'm, I can still do the job. I'm good at what I do and people do see it. And it's OK, because a lot of positions I've held have come due to my work ethic and people see yeah. that I have qualities um, that they need. And so they put me in those positions or will ask me if I would like to step up. And so it's, you know, when these parts of us show up and they're uncomfortable, we may try and have contingencies around them or create these contingencies or stories to be like, it's okay because, you know, but in actual fact, when I sat with those emotions and sensations that I experienced and I asked the hard questions, while it was uncomfortable, I discovered massive truths that have now released me to, in the future, be my present self. And not every interview is going to work out because not every position is made for me. Not every position is timely for my season. And so just knowing that and accepting that it is okay um, and that I need to show up as my authentic self and only work on that internal state. Like who am I showing up? How am I showing up? Am I showing up authentically? Am I able to forgive myself when that doesn't happen? Or am I going to sabotage myself or think that I'm less than or perhaps that I'm an imposter because I had one incident where maybe I didn't do so well? So I really found that it's so essential to know your worth. It's a difference between worth and confidence. 
but to truly understand who you are and that you really, I mean, even with the self-worth that you develop, it's important to always hold true that you're still human. Mm. Um, and so I've been walking this, this thing out the last few weeks where I've been so aware that I'm human and that I'm going to fail and that I'm going to have things that are not going to go to plan and that I'm going to say silly stuff here and there and that it's okay. It doesn't make me less than. And I think for so long I've held on to this um, ideal. You know, we create the ideal of ourselves and our, the ideal of how we want to show up and how we want to be in front of other people. And when that doesn't happen, we're disappointed. But in fact, if we just honor that ideal to ourselves, like what is the yeah. ideal that I want to show up for me, then we know that it's not going to be fake and that it's going to be something we can sustain, something, a state of being in mind that we can always um be cultivating in every situation yeah. because there's always going to be situations where we cannot predict what will happen and you know you walk into an interview you don't know the questions they're going to ask um i remember killing myself trying to prepare and it was nothing you know of what i prepared for um and so yeah it's just isn't it just funny how we have this it's a journey it really is a journey and we all try and make it as if it's an event, but it's actually a journey. It's an ongoing process that continually happens where we just need to keep tapping back into who we are, what's our authentic self, what do we mm. need, and staying true to the person of our being, um, ourselves, rather than having to uphold anyone else's standards. And um, mm. it makes for such a freeing life when we're just like, you know what, yep, don't really care or don't I genuinely and I can feel internally that I don't mind what others might think or how they might perceive me I'm going to have my moments they're going to have their moments but amongst it all it's okay and it gives me the ability to show grace and forgiveness towards others if I'm able to show it to myself mm. wow yeah. so good and yeah yeah it's beautiful like you know you we've got into now um the authentic self it's uh, such a, a beautiful topic but i think we've been touching on a bit in different ways and um i'm really excited to dive into that because what you've shared there it, it is it is important like you know overcoming uh, all those traps uh, of uh, justification all these uh, projections towards an ideal trying to to sort of find ourselves outside of ourselves, <laughs> it's uh, it's a big challenge because we actually don't live there. We, we we live within ourselves, and so when we go seeking uh, all these external aspects, uh, I I think it we we sort of like miss the mark in a way because what we really need to do is align. It's like so we have to honor that we're not going to go outside of ourselves, but we can learn to work with. And because of, you know, like there's a lot of, uh, you know, sweet things that we really like, you know, like, like a, a moral way of looking at the world. It's such a simple model. It's like, you know, right, wrong, that's it. It's like everything you'll see, they'll it will be right or wrong. Um, and if you start to see life in that way, then, you know, it's sort of like uh, sharp edges, right? Uh, there's either this sharp edge or that sharp edge. It's either right or it's not right. And that is all there is. And everything starts to split into two. Uh, you develop this, you'd say, just a dual way of experiencing everything. And so um, what that does then it minimizes everything and sort of like creates a big blob and so you're always trying to split things uh to fit those categories uh however like i like to say it's like there's a there is we need to take a step back it's like there is something before and mm. and and don't get me wrong like i appreciate the moral lens it's very very useful it's very very fundamental and we need it um However, it's not the only one we need to consider. It's like there is all these other nuances that we have to account for. Uh, like we can't, 
we can't dismiss ourselves. So when we get trapped in a moral way of of uh, of seeing the world and experiencing life, we miss a lot of nuances that don't fit those categories. Mm-hmm. And so, but then we have to forcefully fit them in. It's like it must be right. It must be wrong. And and every time we go in that direction, yeah, we're going to suffer the consequences because we're boxing it in. We're locking it. We're not, we're not working with it. We're, we're jumping to a conclusion as opposed to understanding what is there. And so I feel like we, as a way to, you know, even improve how we are seeing and how we are understanding what's going on. Like the, the first thing is to acknowledge what is there. It's like we have to acknowledge ourselves before we judge ourselves, right? And of course, our own self critiques and our own egos, they, they do, you know, hold us up to very high standards. And so we can't escape that. However, um, we need to acknowledge that even by the mere fact of being here, like just mm-hmm. being alive, uh, that there's something right about that, mm-hmm. right? And in the in the Bible, and I don't know if I shared this story with you, like you know when they talk about the right hand of God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For the longest time, I was wondering, does God have a left hand as well? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Because, I mean, like, it, you choose whichever side, right? Uh, but it turns out it's, um, at least what I've come to learn about it is, it's more about finding the right attunement. It's like mm. the, you, you're tuning in to the clarity of the signal of experience of life. And there is a place where it's it's more clear than another. It's like the quality of what it is that you're getting or or what it is that you're experiencing can improve. And it's not that the current quality is not accepted. It's more that, you know, you could improve that. You could get better. You could, uh, you could get, you could get it clearer if Mm -hmm. I may put it that way. And so the righteousness is about, you know, chasing, you'd say chasing the the place where you need to be because you you need to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. So finding that right stance, because if it is the right stance, then it just mm-hmm. works. Like your response mm-hmm. works well. Um, there's an old philosopher, he writes a little bit about this, about the... The experience of uh, of our subject and our environment. It's like we have to. Uh, there's a relationship, right? Like with our physical environment. Uh, if I try to punch my hand through the wall, the wall has a certain form it holds. Like it it resists, right? Like it will resist. And if I if I somehow do not appreciate its resistance and and learn to work with it, then my hand's gonna get hurt. Right. Mm -hmm. However, there's a difference if I try to punch my hand through a piece of cloth, the piece of cloth does not resist. It sort of like responds to the the impression I make upon it. And so in so doing, uh, that's a different kind of relationship whereby my hand can change, can rearrange uh, that material. But my hand cannot rearrange all sorts of material. There's, so, so my hand needs to know that there's, mm-hmm. there's places where it can <laughs> express itself through and there's places where it won't be able to express itself. And so uh, having that distinction and being aware of it and also knowing that it's all changing. You know, like they say, change is the only constant. This is very true because... We are changing. Our environment is changing. The situations are always changing. Everything is changing. It's we live in a dynamical system. Uh, uh, they they use that term to define it. And I think even if we live in a dynamical system, there is a, a, a right way to orient ourselves in that system, such that 
we stay there because uh, as nature is a very ruthless, you'd say customer, uh, if you're not right, you just die. <laughs> like it kills you off. And and we see this all the time. Like you, 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 we're trying to not end up being on the wrong side of nature uh, mm. because it will wipe us out. And But we forget that. We forget that even by just being here, being alive in this moment, that that is a successful move, right? Mm. So it means whatever you're doing is not to be dismissed. It may, it can be improved, but it can only be improved if it's acknowledged. And I feel like that is the starting point of authenticity, like allowing, allowing what is there, seeing what is there, appreciating and acknowledging what is there before we start to do the moral filtering of, you know, what should we do more of? What should we minimize? I think, first of all, we need to acknowledge and appreciate what is there, what is here right now, how are we fitting in it? Uh, because then, uh, then, then we have a better, we know what we're working with and we can't start improving before we know what we're working with. Yeah. yeah, and I think too, like you mentioned, being aware of it. So I think it starts with knowing ourselves. And often, as you mentioned at the start, is that we look on the outside for our meaning and for our identity. We look to things that we can do or, or things that we can um, achieve. And those seem to, for whatever reason, have marked us or given us the identity that we then try and function from. But yeah. really, authenticity is about knowing the self, you know, knowing thyself. There's so much um, that even it, as a man thinketh, um, it talks about in the book about knowing yourself and knowing how you operate and really paying attention to the inclinations you have as a human because they're going to be different to the next human next to you. And so, yeah, I think it's a focus of looking within and I heard this um the other day that you know some people are saying well it's not about looking within it's about looking outwards but I think it depends on the context that we're talking about and so if mm -hmm. we're talking about getting to know who we are and who we've been designed to to be let us look within as to what we've been given to steward right um, and so God has created us fearfully and wonderfully. And so we need to look at ourselves and say, okay, how does one operate? Why does she operate like that? Why does she think like that? What are the thoughts that are crossing through my mind? Paying attention to those thoughts and taking them captive so I can analyze and I can understand where they might be coming from. Did I allow things to come in that maybe are not part of who I'm designed to be and the way that I'm designed to think? But I can only know that if I'm focusing and I'm paying attention to what I'm doing rather than just doing it because we've been brought up to just do things, right? And so we've developed behaviors based on things we've seen, based on things we've experienced as children. And so we grow into this way of being, a way of moving in the world and way of exploring or um, way of doing the work, whatever it is, that is really, I don't know how much it is part of our authenticity as it is part of expectation and outside influences because we grow up and we see other people do things and we're like, oh, that's what I need to do and that's what I need to aspire to. And, you know, there's these ideals that we're given. And so I really always um, had this struggle and this um, battle within me of like, oh, I need to aspire to that, but I constantly feel like something's not right, like it's not aligning with me. And and so God was constantly saying like, that's not who I designed to be or that's not how I think success happens. That's not how I think things should go. That's not the plan. That's not my plan. That's not how I see things. And so I had to come back and align with, okay, who do you say I am? And so looking within, I'm able to identify my characteristics that set me apart. And being true to myself means that then I honor those characteristics. I honor the one other that shows up and that doesn't believe in certain things or believes in certain things. I don't make excuses for it. I just honor that, that it's different to you and I. And I also bring compassion to understand that while we may differ, we can still get along. We can still build together. And so I really appreciate the way you described that authenticity and with those examples and, and you know, aligning with 
our true design aligning back to the the center of who we are and what what makes us unique rather than what makes us the same um and i really appreciate that because it's a battle for so many i've realized that so many struggle with this concept of you know what society says we should do and what society says we should achieve um and then oh but i'm i'm not feeling satisfied i'm not feeling happy i don't feel like i've achieved a lot of things i don't feel like i'm you know it and it's like um i was listening to a podcast this morning and they gave this explanation about how we find self-worth and how we tell ourselves that when i get this car when i get this job when i get this when i when this happens then i'll be right and it's such a lie because you get to that and so many people have gotten to that and we know we can look you know in the books that have been written and the dreams that have been lost that people get to that and all of a sudden they're like oh it didn't feel like i thought it would feel and it doesn't really align with what i thought that i would experience or be right because we expect this grand thing transformation to happen once we've reached that goal and so when it doesn't happen then we continue to tell ourselves a lie of I just need to work harder. I need to work better. I need to be more efficient. I need to, and I know I've struggled terribly with this, but then I look around and so many people have the same struggle in that we're trying to find the essence of us in the things we do or the things around mm. us. And so mm. the essence of us is really within us, isn't it? And uh, us aligning with it takes that intentionality and that focus and allowing ourselves to just flourish, allow yourself to make the mistake, allow yourself to be okay with what's showing up okay this is showing up right now why is that showing up give yourself that grace and i know it's really difficult to do and it's always going to be this journey and this constant transcendence but if you don't do it well it's still happening in some way if i don't intentionally engage with the process of growing to understand myself then i'm growing away from myself whether i like it or not there's something constantly growing as you said that the only constant is the transformation right the 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 state of being is always changing. The context is always changing. The world is always changing. And so if I'm not intentional with that, then I might end up in a place. I might end up a person, a, an identity that I don't want to be. Um, but it's really difficult, isn't it? It's really difficult because you've got the constant like, and you have to constantly cover yourself and be like, okay, you know, maybe affirmations or whatever it might be, but just remind us to be like, I am this, I can do this. It's okay if I fail. And it's that constant ritual of coming back and checking in with the self. What is it that I'm struggling with? Why am I struggling with that? Where do I find healing? Asking the right questions and really facing that thing and going through the process um, is really transformative, but it's certainly not a one-time thing. No, not at all. It cannot be a one-time thing. It's a, it's a, it's a gradual, always ongoing, continuous process. Uh, and I think that's one of the mistakes that happens, especially at a young age. Um, it sort of feels as though, like, you know, because you, you, you're learning this idealism that is being passed on to you, and, and it's all part of, you know, you're, you're being taken through these, all, all these processes, right? Like, uh, whoever is passing on the information cannot give you all of all of it, right? Like the whole set, it's just too broad. And so they can only give you a little bit. But I think what we, what we need to start doing more, even as, you know, as parents, as, you know, educators and people teaching uh, other people, it's more like we have to acknowledge that we can't pass on all the information uh, and declare this to them uh, so that they don't hold it as absolute, right? Um, you know, looking back when I was growing up, and <clears throat> part of it is like the the tyranny of language. Like the, the it's it's something hard to articulate, especially if you're trying to uh, articulate the danger in not doing something, or if if you're trying to protect uh, as you you teach someone, you're trying to protect them from something that could go wrong, right? And so the intention is really good. Like it, it's coming from a, pre, a place of care. You're trying to pass on all these tools that someone is going to need. And you have to add the emphasis, 
mm-hmm. of, of why this is important. And even when you emphasize, you know that that's not all there is to it. But it's difficult because how do you say this without undermining um, without undermining what you're trying to put across, right? It's like, yes, do that, um, but it may not work completely because if you say that, then they're not going to take it seriously, of course. Uh, mm. So I think we have a, a much bigger challenge whereby we we need to cultivate uh, a different way, let's say, of communicating such that mm. Uh, it's not it's not rigid. It's not mm-hmm. boxing in when we communicate. And so focusing on on opening up and focusing on revealing what is there and teaching a different, you know, p- putting the speech to communicate more accurately. Uh, I think that is very helpful. Uh, yesterday, uh, picking up, uh, the children Delvin challenged me on something like you know he 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 said that I misspoke about something like we have because he's grown up here mostly uh, and I haven't so I have a different accent from him so when I say something um, he sometimes feels the need to correct me and so we're having a bit of a, a chat about it uh, because I speak differently because of where I learned how to speak. Mm. So so this is how I know how to say these words. Now, it doesn't mean this is how he knows how to say them. Uh, he knows a different way. But we need to appreciate each other's difference of how we say the things and translate what is meant, right? Uh, I, I, if, if you call something one way, but you know the other person calls it a different way. Like, you, well, it, it may be playful. Like, you could make banter mm-hmm. about this. But if the, if it's not a banterful moment, then there is no need for that because then it starts to become annoying, and you you start evoking unnecessary negative emotion. And and so, what is helpful is to be respectful of uh, of their way. And sort of like not not dismiss it, not try to change it, uh, because they will invite you to even support the change if you can accept it, right? And so you have you have to accept, and that is with the other. But we also need to do that for ourselves. We have to accept. Like it took me a long time to acknowledge that I have I have an accent that the people I speak with here don't understand and so i have to learn i have to cultivate techniques that are going to help me get through to them and what does that mean i need to speak a bit slower in certain situations i need to i need to be more audible like you know open open my jaws more when i speak so that the words can come out Mm. and and they they can be heard by them when they listen and it's like that is the work I need to do to to, to, come, to be better understood. Um, but if we're all doing our work, then we're all going to be better understood, right? And, you know, trying to acknowledge the, the areas and pitfalls where we could get trapped. Uh, mm-hmm. I, like, I like this new phrasing, and it's, it's sort of like a lot of people are picking up on it. You know, you'll hear a lot of people describe what they're hearing. Uh, this is a new trend. This this is something that has only started like around COVID days. <laughs> Pre-COVID times, this was not a thing. People would just speak and everybody just assumes that uh, they know what they're talking about. But when you start to pay attention to what you're hearing, you start to quickly notice that you're not hearing as well as you thought you are, right? Oh, and the person you, you're you listening to also starts to realize that they're not as articulate as they as assumed they were. There's, you know, when, whenever it happens, like, oh, I'm hearing you say this, right? Like, <laughs> same with, you know, with the children. I was, I was trying to, to, to explain how this technique works. So 
the other one goes like, oh, um, that's a yellow car. And so I tell him, I'm hearing you say it, it's a green car. And he said, no, I did not. I said, it's yellow. It's like, yes, the, the point of the exercise is for you to notice how I'm hearing you. And intervene and help me hear you better, <laughs> right? Because if you don't intervene, then I am mishearing you and it's just going to keep going. Uh, mm -hmm. But we get we get combative in those situations uh, and, and we don't declare ourselves. And so you have these people sort of like just bashing your heads. But you say this and it means that. And, I, you know, that's what you meant. They jump quickly to what they interpreted before declaring what they heard. And I feel like we need to learn more to do that because it's so easy. It resolves conflict so easily the moment you reveal yourself and say well this is you, uh, uh, this is what i'm hearing uh please tell me am i hearing you correctly everyone is going to be willing to correct you now of course not everybody in some cases people may make fun of you uh, but majority of the people want to be understood so if you're mishearing them and you declare that they're going to be willing to you know, correct the the miscommunication, and and in the process you learn how to communicate with these people, right? And and in the process they learn how to communicate with you because and then we can get into we can we can overcome our biases and our misunderstandings and just get to the place where we are we're just relating and and you know communing with each other as opposed to being in the place where we're trying to sort out the difference and bashing our heads on it. Uh, I have a friend with whom we could never, you know, talk for five minutes before we are stuck in the definition of words. What do you mean when you say that? Oh, I mean this. Oh, but I think it means this. I think your meaning is wrong. I don't think that's a real word. Uh, <laughs> please use this other word. And so it's it's not it's not a good place to be. It's not mm. an because you you're trying to get to a place where you can have some sort of communing, some sort of communication, some sort of uh, exchange of experience, uh, but you're stuck at the door. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. You're stuck at the door with the definitions and all these things. Uh, however, if we cultivate those, uh, those capabilities whereby we start to get more authentic, we start to reveal ourselves, we start to be okay with uh, our biases and own up to them and declare them. It's like, well, look, I usually have a tendency to do this. Um, so please watch out for that and, and call me out if I do that thing because it just happens to me. I don't intend <laughs> that it turns out that way, but it does happen. It's something that happens. So please watch out for it. Uh, and it could even go farther because you can declare how you're feeling in a situation. Say, well, I'm feeling a bit... In a, in, a, in a low mood today, so I'm, uh, I'm likely to be very negative and very judgmental. So please watch out for those kinds of expressions uh, as we interact, because I don't mean them that way. It's just the situation that I'm in and how I'm showing up is influencing me to be that way. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you don't do it, then we're going to quickly, you know, people just quickly, you know, minimize your expression as who you are and they'll kind of go like oh look at you mr grumpy what is going on with you so I, but i could have said oh well i'm feeling a bit sad today and there's all these reasons of why i'm feeling sad then they would be a bit nicer because i already declared what's going on but if i didn't and then started to be all grumpy and reactive then that's going to be a problem because they have issues as well they could be grumpy about. And even my response is probably being uh, received in a way that's making them sad and grumpy. And, and that should, like, like it happens, but we don't need to get there. Like we don't need to get there. We, the, we can preempt all these things uh, way ahead of time. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you make of that. <laughs> mm, I really love the way you um, really... Um, unfolded that if I could use that word because 
language is often perceived as something outside of us. It's often perceived as something we just say to get what we want or to get people to hear or understand. But actually, language is within us because we assign meaning to language. And you spoke about how there's a struggle with you um, maybe initially not being aware that the way you speak sounds different to other people. And for you, when you speak, the meaning it holds to you, the words that you use and the way that you convey your message, it sounds different to you. And that's your meaning, right? And so meaning is what really ties in the actual language itself, which can be flat, to language being alive and having the essence of transferring um, information. Um, and so those people who are hearing you, they're interpreting something else because of the meaning they attach to that language that they understand. And so you spoke about the you know, context in which you speak. Um, so you come from a different country and your initial language has really formed or shaped the way that you speak this language, English or whatever other language that you have. Um, and I think it's under, it's important to understand those nuances because that's where you you know we can and you spoke about how we can bring meaning that is communal and communal means that we can share in the same meaning by bringing um, a grace to understanding or an intentionality to being together to the point that we understand each other um, mm -hmm. and it's so fascinating isn't it that like we can say a word we can talk in a certain way and for whatever reason right it's often related to how we might be feeling or the thing that we want to be you know the light we might want to be seen in or um, we get excited about a phrase or a um, topic and we just say it um, but the meaning is then echoed through to those who are hearing us and and um, yeah, it's, it's a process to understand the meaning that others are receiving and to constantly formulate or reformulate the way that our message is given out um, because we all seek to be understood. And you spoke about this tension of like some people getting really heated up about a certain word or a certain way of saying. And I think when we have that resistance to what language could be, we'll never experience the fullness of what language actually is because I believe that language is always transcendent. It has the ability to be flexible and has the ability to be used in certain contexts in, in different ways. Um, and I've seen it, like Dr. Shafali uses a lot of really interesting terms to describe um, certain nuances of her practice and, and what, you know, her philosophy is built on. And, you know, when I listen to her, I'm like, oh, wow, she's applying like cooking to her, you know, principles about parenting. And it's so cool, right? And so I think if we have the rigidity, it says more about us and our limitation to the ability to perceive what language has the ability to give us. Our, our resistance is more like, now nah, I need to be right. I need to, this is how it is. This, this is, you know. And so if you've got those people in your life that are like, but the dictionary says, um, I think they're missing the beautiful transcendence of language. Language can be flexible and it can be used in certain ways that can convey the same message. Um, but, you know, also be colorful. We can just use different words for different things. And there are instances, of course, where we need to be mindful and careful how language is used um, because people aren't of maybe the same developmental level when it comes to language as we might be, or they're not exposed to all of the same um, experiences and, and um, things that are that have happened to us. And so mm. bringing understanding into those contexts and situations is really key, being sensitive to the other person. And if they're not understanding something, okay, how can I change the language that I'm using? How can I make it so that it conveys the message that I wish to transfer? Um, mm. And so I think each one of us has a responsibility to be sensitive and not to be holding on to um, this, or, you know, they have to understand me. And I think I, as you were talking about this rigidity around language, I was kind of thinking in my own life when I've been rigid to anything, you know, rigid to my own self-growth and thinking, mm -hmm. no, I'm doing things right. What is, you know, why do people tell me I'm not doing things right? Um, it's often then stopped me from having um, abundance of experiences where I'm allowed to 
really grow as a person and to get to know me or to have opportunities that otherwise I would never see. Um, mm. And so I think, yeah, I would just challenge people if you have that rigidity or feel that restriction to ask yourself where, th- where that's coming from. Because at the mm. end of the day, I don't need to, I don't need to really argue what you're saying. If I don't understand it, I can convey that to you. And I can say, I, I really don't understand it, but let me chew on it. Or I really don't understand it. And I'm not sure that I will understand it, but I appreciate what you're sharing and I appreciate or I can hold space for you to have your message sent, to have your message, you know, out there with me. Um, And it's, it's, you know, probably going to sit with me for a while while I stew on it and it's going to maybe bring some revelation over time. But for now, I just don't understand your message. Um, There's a difference to, you know, being totally like, take your message back and, being a rebounding board, you know, um, as to accepting and being like, okay, we might communicate differently, but I'm really interested in what you have to say. So maybe if you were willing to say it differently or if you allow me some time to sit with it and see where this message is taking me, there is so much um, value in being open to language as it is being open to experiences and exposure. You know, um, I think too often we limit ourselves and our life and, and we limit our success, success because we've got these rigid constructs. You know, life has to look like this. Um, this situation has to look like this and everything has, you know, language has to look like this. But in fact, or fact, all of these um, concepts are always changing. They're always taking on new form, right? Language is taken on a new form with each generation. We have text message language that we talk about and it's you know difficult for those who are not using it to decode, right? And so language is always changing. And so we can also grow with it and change with it to understand it and use it to our advantage. And so I think remove the constructs and allow yourself to know that in each circumstance, regardless of how things are presented, you're going to be okay. You're going to be safe. And and yeah. I just really feel like there's something on this ability to shift things in our mind that allows us to see with hope through no matter what is presented to us, whether it's language, whether mm. it's an experience or a circumstance, but just allow yourself to be like, okay, I wonder where that's going. I wonder what that is giving me because everything works together for your good being in a conversation where you're not understanding a message and your ability to ask questions that's going to work for your good because then you're going to have a greater understanding of not only the message but the way that that person particularly conveys information right and so it gives you that open door to have more conversations or to have a say in that person's life and build rich relationships and i think that's the aim isn't it with our communication that we build relationships that we pass on knowledge that we have an acquisition of experiences that are really fulfilling for our lives and give us a really good quality of life that is sustainable Mm. and so we can't have it in one interaction and just with the people that agree with us it's in the community that disagrees that we often grow and can experience that quality of life. And so allow yourself to be molded and to be shaped differently, not to your own constructs. And when you let go of your constructs, one of the first things from my experience is that you often feel like, oh my gosh, like I've got no bearings, right? Mm -hmm. I I feel like I'm shaking, like I'm on the waves, but in actual fact, you will be okay. The experience itself will hold you and create a new path Um, And you'll find yourself in freedom because you've allowed yourself to just see beyond the limitations, beyond the um, rigid construct that I used to have for whatever reason. Um, But now I'm, I'm perceiving opportunity. I'm perceiving um, abundance in everything that is before me. And so I really appreciate how you shared um, the nuance and the, the meaning or context of, of language. I think it's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. And yeah, wow. And it reminds me of that conversation we had with Daniel about about language uh, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> yes, and, and, and you know, it, it's just a tool to get us to the meaning. It's a tool to get us to the meaning. And we should always be aware of it because we can get locked into it and forget the goal uh, of what it's there for. Uh, I mean, it, it's... It's not like a typical tool. Of course, it's, it's alive. It's within how we express ourselves. And 
and we express ourselves at all different levels. And so that can be a challenge to work with. However, I feel we need to treat it with the appropriate respect and know that this is a, it's like a magical tool that has some powers with it that we have to treat with respect. Otherwise, it also has the ability to modify everything for us. I always go back to that example of, uh, you know, the creation moment, right? <laughs> God has all the tools available to him. Why does he pick the word? And mm. part, partly because, you know, the word is essentially the only, you'd say, artifact you have access to the conceptual world, like the spiritual world. And so words are very powerful. <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> we have to use them carefully. Otherwise, they can, they shape, they shape worlds, right? Like they, they, you, you, what is the phrase? Name it to tame it? Mm. Yes. Uh, but the problem is sometimes if you tame it, you know, if you name it and then it is tamed, then it stops being alive. So you have to be very careful <laughs> what you're taming because mm. that's why, so, you know, in some traditions they don't have a name for God because you don't want to minimize. Um, you want to always experience and transcend and, and, you know, keep arising to that experience. Uh, so, yes, we do need to respect language and use it carefully um, because essentially once we start to understand our own language of being, our own language of experience, then we start to own it better. And that always drives us to become more authentic because we now have more ownership of how we're showing up, what we're, you know, what we're expressing. And we're no longer, we're no longer playing the performative game of, of trying to copy or trying to look just a, you know, like a certain projection because we've discovered there's a, there's a real essence. There's a real uniqueness to us. Mm. And the real particularity of how how we experience that that now we are respecting and in service to, and so taking that and appreciating it is is really where the the authenticity starts. Like you, no, no authentic person does not acknowledge that that they, there's a difference that they make to the situation, and that they have you know they have this body of experience that they bring with them. And so they have to always uh, stand up for it and express it because it is important. It, is, it has to be accounted for. Otherwise, uh, then there's consequences when it's minimized. It still speaks up in you because you minimized it. You didn't let it out. And mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where the ego likes to go. It's like, oh, but, you know, <laughs> you didn't speak up when you had the time. You know, you didn't, you didn't reveal yourself. And so it just reminds you of all the consequences of not actually owning up to that nature, mm -hmm. to, that, to that truth that is always unfolding and that's coming up. And, and so the more we do that, the closer we get to where we need to be. The, 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 the more right reality becomes, the more that relationship starts to feel right the and and consequently all these uh, anxieties and uh, unnecessary worries start to sort of like fade away uh, because now you're starting to acknowledge that certain things that you felt <laughs> needed adjustment actually don't need adjustment it's more you need to learn to work with them uh, mm. What does that serenity prayer say about uh, asking for God the, the strength to change the things that you can and the grace to accept the things that you cannot? Yes, yes. <laughs> we have to we have to hold the two. Yeah, we, we do need strength to change some of the things that we can change. However, not all things can be changed, and so some things we just have to. We need grace. We need grace to accept mm. them and appreciate them and learn to work with them because they are, you know, 
they're not things we have a choice in, right? It's mm. like they get given to you. Uh, Daniel from OG Rose likes to use that language of the givens. It's like, yes, there are things that are given to you and you just have to work with. Or you mm. have to learn how to work with. And so having the distinction and not not assuming that everything is given or that there are things that, that that everything is changeable, sort of like holding both in contention is very, very critical to being uh, authentic. And I think before you can do that, you have to allow and you have to accept that that is uh, a real reality. Um, yeah. And so, well, I think we've come up to time and I just want to give you I want to give it back to you to see if you have any closing words. Uh, but it was really, really great talking to you as well. As well. Mm, such a pleasure. And I love how we've done a full circle. And in your last um, few sharing, you went back to that authenticity. We spoke about, you know, we started out with authenticity and grace and giving ourselves the space to be okay with what's happening and, and the use of language. Um, and I just love how... Yes, language is, is transcending, language is flexible, and yet there's a, a part of language that we can't change or part of language that just is, right? And so we have to have this fine balance, and I think it's, um, I think it's a privilege to be able to communicate and to have this complexity of holding the two in, in balance. I think it's such a privilege to be alive, to be human, and to have the capability of language to communicate and to have a, a richness of life. Um, you know, like plants and animals don't communicate the, the way that we do. And I feel like we have a greater vocabulary and often it's the, the use of our vocabulary is not even to the extent that is available to us. And so I'm really appreciative of um, that nuance um, available to us as humans. And I'm so grateful for this conversation because it's brought so much more understanding for myself, but also I hope and believe for others as to how they can better communicate and allowing themselves to not hold on to a word or a phrase or something said, but to perceive it as language. And that language yeah. can be seen in different views within different yeah. contexts. It's not necessarily the end all and be all of something said in this moment. And so I just want to yeah, leave everyone with that. And, and again, go back to your authenticity and who you are and you, who you were created to be and honor that, that you will understand language differently, that you will receive it differently, that you will accept what sounds right to you if you know what your authentic self is. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much, Juana. Thank you. Thanks for having me.